We're going to read a prayer together this morning um, while we light the Advent candles that signify hope from last week and peace, which is the theme for this week. If Advent means anything this year, it must surely mean that Jesus is still the Jewish baby, frightened for his life, and also still the displaced child, fleeing the land of his birth with his terrified family, hoping for safety in Egypt. If Advent means anything this year, as our candles flicker while cities burn, it must surely mean that Christ is coming specifically, explicitly to Bethlehem and Gaza, Khartoum, and Kiev. If Advent means anything this year, as consumer spending soars while millions can't afford to heat their homes, it must surely mean that God himself will soon be found in prosperous nations, visiting the elderly lonely, standing in line with those whose daily bread comes from food banks. If Advent means anything this year, in the wake of too many scandals to mention, it must surely mean that Christ is on his way once again to the cold, dark, dirty manger of my own cold, dark, dirty heart. Healer of nations, we solemnly ask that you would return to us this Advent. Prince of Peace, we need you more this year than ever. If Advent means anything this year, it's an ancient lament expressed in the oldest and shortest, most desperate and most important word the church ever prayed. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. We, uh, we want to be a church that, that lives into Jesus' call to be peacemakers, not just with our words and not just with our songs or our worship, but with our whole lives. And, and so living into that, certainly there's moments of time like this where we set aside and direct our hearts um, but then there's also the, the, the offering of our time and our resources and our gifts to, to bring and live into those, those definitions. definitions of peace. I, I was reading an article this week um, about like, the giving habits of generations uh, in light of what's happening in the world right now. And, uh, and this may or may not surprise you, I, I don't know, but like, sort of like the, the generation that's often lumped as like, the most selfish and self-seeking is the generation. Um, who is right now, statistically speaking, the most like eager to want to give of their resources, even if they don't have like the same amount of resources as older generations do. And yet, um, you know, those that often are sort of noted as like being the ones that are kind of the bedrocks of giving are kind of in light of the things happening in the world, you know, statistically speaking in this article, it was saying are kind of like locking up and going, ah, what can you do? Like, and, and what I just what I think this moment invites us to do, and this is why we, we talk about generosity every week of time, but also financial resources, particularly on a subject like peace is to sort of stoke that childlike faith, like to stoke that childlike wonder, the wonder of our youth that says, hey, I, I get to be a part of the things God is doing in the world, and that like this is, this is crazy, but God uses my little to do a lot more than I would be able to do with that little. And so when I align myself to the way of Jesus in terms of offering my time and offering my talents and offering my financial resources, incredible things happen in the world and and to do that when our when our hearts as a way of protection are kind of going eh what can you do what can anybody do right what can any of us do what would, what good would my money do what good would my time do to any of the things that Josie just mentioned in this world right so so giving becomes this act of worship to help keep us soft soft to the things that God is doing in the world. And so that's part of why we invite you to be a generous people, to, to live on mission with financial generosity and generosity of time and generosity of spirit. And if, uh, if the foundry is a place where you want to practice that and, be, and if it were good soil for that to, to be planted into the ground, you can be on mission with us at foundrybaltimore.com slash give or by mail or give in the back of the room if, if, if you want to do that by means of, of finances. Um, let's turn the page and think a little bit more about this idea of peace and the Peace Sunday, but first let me tell you a quick story. Um, it was uh, a Monday afternoon and I was 
It's filling out an expense report. It was a glamorous Monday afternoon, and uh, the, the, the screen locked up because even the screen was bored by what was happening, and, uh, and I had to do the, the restart, the hard restart. Well, many, many times with this old MacBook Air friend of mine, that hard restart brings it right back to where it was. I love that about the MacBook, but not this time. This time, I got an icon with a question mark blinking at me, which is Apple's way of saying, be more, we have a problem, right? And so uh, I knew something was wrong, something was amiss. I'd never seen a message like this before. Um, I take it to our friends in MacMedics, who I highly commend. Um, and they've done lots of good work on this little MacBook of mine that's been my companion for the entire life of the public gatherings of our church. Um, because I got it the week before the church launched, or the week of the church's launch. And, uh, and they took a look at it, and they said to me, uh, well, friend, call the priest. It's time to say goodbye to your MacBook Air and to remember all the good times that you had with that friend. And they asked this critical question, did you back up? To which I said, yes, I did, in fact, back that thing up. You know, like, I, I'm confident. I know I look like the guy and a guy that, like, lives on the edge of danger, I look like that kind of guy, that real rebel spirit, but I did, I do not like to live dangerously, and so to my capacities and abilities, I did in fact back that thing up, right? And uh, I don't think they found that funny, by the way. And, uh, and, and, and but, but here's the thing, right? Like, so I get the new computer, and they're, they're telling me and assuring me that the process of transition is a pretty smooth one, um, but it's not, it hasn't been for me. Um, I did do a backup. Someone said to me the first hour, did you do a backup? I'm just like, I did do a backup. But, there, but there's just something that's not computing and working together, which is certainly, most certainly, my own error. But I have yet to figure out and get to the bottom of what's going on and why this new computer won't talk to the time machine and yada, yada, yada. Okay? So um, here's why this matters. I'm a pretty glass half empty guy about a lot of things. Like, someone's like, hey, what's, hey, how do you feel about the Ravens game today? I'm like, well, here's how it's going to go in the element. You know, like, I, I like always as a self protection sort of look for, the, for the, like, the thing that could happen or go wrong. But I'm not that way about this, right? I'm, I'm like, ah, it's probably going to work out. It's going to be irritating. It's going to be costly, perhaps. It's going to be frustrating in terms of my time. It's probably going to work out. But, it's annoying and frustrating in the present tense to, to do things like today where you're like, I had a sermon written six weeks ago for the second Sunday of Advent. And I was like, look at me getting a head strut like John Travolta in a Santa Claus outfit. And then like you sit down this week and you're like, oh yeah, remember when I had that sermon done? Yeah, it's frustrating, right? And I think there's an Advent reflection in this. Right? Just, for nothing else, just indulge the fact that I, this irritation, I just want to be a good story, if nothing else. That, that I think a lot of us, if we're, if we're familiar with the Advent season and we've practiced the rhythms of Advent in times past, there's this thing now that we've sort of like unlocked in ourselves that we do believe that like hope and peace and joy and love that have arrived once in a manger in Bethlehem and are going to arrive in the, in, as, as Jesus fulfills the promises to, to come back and to make all things new. Like, like, like if this is not our first advent, we've believed in this for some time, then perhaps for us, we're just living in the messy in between. Like, yes, it's going to be resolved, but it just doesn't feel very resolved today, and that's incredibly frustrating. And so if that's you this morning, the journey that we're on in this Advent season with a Christmas to remember is not to say, well, just cling to the Hallmark movies and pretend that life's beautiful and nothing hurts and just, uh, you know, inoculate yourself with like 30 days of jams and cocos and, and like all of the, you know, the trappings of your favorite, you know, this, the only reason why you still have a DVD player is to watch Christmas movies. You know, like that's not really what it is we've come to do, but rather to say, to acknowledge that in the moment, there are moments that hope and peace and joy and love feel really fleeting. And if we're not a follower of Jesus, and we're sort of skeptical about all of this, and we're kind of wondering why generations of people would even invite this into their December celebrations, one of the things an Advent journey can do is, is point to the idea that, that uh, 
that there wasn't just a group of people trying to make sense of the life and death of someone that they thought was pretty cool sometime in the first century. That, that there, throughout the scriptures, from the book of Genesis on, have been this, this, this promise to, to make right what has been fractured between God and mankind, and that for the hundreds of years prior to the arrival of Jesus on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem in Bethlehem, there have been these, 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 these signposts to say there is one who is coming to make things right, to make all things new, and, and to just take a look with fresh eyes and say, hey, what if, what if we moved past the cynicism of just like, oh, the, the, the stinking people and their sentimentality, I can't handle it. And to say, hey, with fresh eyes, even if I'm not a follower of Jesus, can I pay attention to the, 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 the claims that are being made about what hope and peace and joy and love really point to in light of, in light of what's actually being promised by the scriptures? So we have these choices about what we do with the reality of our lives. And this is, this is the journey of Advent, you know, beyond the jams and beyond the Hallmark movies and beyond the beyond all of the festivities and the trappings. One is to ask ourselves, in light of the reality that you're feeling today, will we wall up? Will we like build walls of self-protection? Will we get cynical and kind of surly and a little crustier with every decade of age? You know, and we'll chalk it up to the salt and pepper of good wisdom about the way the world works because that's easier than sort of softening up to the possibility that we might be disappointed Will we cover up? Will we settle into denial or bluster or false optimism? We get really frustrated when governments or churches do things like that, but for us, it's just fine. For us, it's, it's a way to, to keep the peace around us. Like, it's okay to not be okay unless you're not okay, and then just cover up. Pretend that everything's going to be all right. Or, Will we open up? Will we open up to the possibility of the peace of God arriving in our midst? There's a, there's a phrase in the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah attributed to Jesus, the one who will come and make things right, attributed to, you, you've maybe heard it before, even if you didn't know which book of the Bible it came from, the idea of a prince of peace. Have you heard that before? The prince of peace. You've heard worship songs that point to the prince of peace and um, this idea that the, 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 there's a going to be, who's going to be one who's going to come. He will be the prince of peace. Well, the 40th through 66th chapter of the book of Isaiah, which jumps 150 years, part of why it's a confusing book to read, is, is, is really saying, hey, what will be the qualities and the characteristics of that prince of peace? And what will peace look like when that servant king has come, when God has, has made right what has been fractured? So chapter 40 through chapter 66 are, are really a lengthy reflection about the character of that piece and the weight of that piece. We're going to look at the first section that you may be familiar with if you, if you love classical music and you've been rocking like Handel's Messiah lately. You're going to, you're going to recognize some of these, these verbs and these words and, and some of the things that are going to be pointed to in, in this text today. It's a very famous section of scripture. But, but let's, with, with fresh eyes and in fresh ears and fresh hearts, let's, let's look at it, pay attention to it, and see what it's telling us about what it means to embrace this prince of peace and God's picture of peace in a world where we don't feel a lot of peace all right this begins with the idea of rejecting the false pictures of peace in our midst rejecting the false pictures of peace in our midst it's, a, it's maybe the gateway to opening up to this picture the section begins chapter 40 verses 1 and 2 comfort comfort my people says your God Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are a little bit depressing as it relates to the human heart. You know, here's the things God's people put their hope in, and here's what it delivered. It delivered captivity. It delivered enslavement. It delivered... Um, like, like harming other people. It delivered the neglect of the poor. It delivered nothing that was the, the reductionist picture of comfort that were promised, right? And you, you know this all the time, that there's things that are sort of sold to you, like they're going to provide you some sort of relief or reprieve. 
um, and maybe you, you go into debt to get the thing, uh, and then it doesn't actually deliver. Or it delivers, but it's kind of like, man, it, it was okay. It was, it, it, it was fine. And then we have to like, talk ourselves into justifying the expense or the time spent or the particular thing, right? What's happened up to this point have been these, these comforts, these small C comforts have been the things that God's people have pursued, right? What are the things that feel good in our moment, good in our midst, the political expedience, the aligning, the aligning to, to the things of comfort? And, and what did those things deliver? They delivered bondage. They delivered emptiness. They brought harm to people. They neglected the poor. They did not call upon the way of God. And so, and so in this idea that there's a new chapter... And there's a new dawn, and, and the chapter of 40 is a turning point in the book. There is this picture, comfort, comfort my people. Like, it's not an accidental there twice. It's a purposeful, like, restatement. Comfort is the word. Like, this is what I'm inviting. And then this idea of my people. Despite what's happened in the first 39 chapters, despite the desolation, despite the nonsense that you've pursued, despite what it's given you, I'm still here, and there's a new day afoot. Pay attention. Look to it. See my faithfulness in this moment, that I I want to be a restorer, that that you're still my people, that this time of exile is over, that you are not disowned. You belong to me. Now, for some of us, we've heard this phrase since we were like little ones, and it's just kind of wrote to us. I mean, uh, and so, so if that's you, I think what I want to just call you to is to the reminder of, of like, there are so many things in your life selling you small sea comforts, right? Like, if you do this thing, you're going to reach sentimental, warm Christmas magic. If you do this thing, you're going to feel financially at peace. If you feel this thing, you're going to feel warm and fuzzy in your emotional relationships. And you know just how fleeting all of this stuff is. And so even if you've been hearing this this promise of God's comfort and God's presence and God's restoration from a young age, here's what I would point out to you, that like the way of Jesus has lasted longer than an array of things that when you were five years old, you thought were bringing you comfort. That when you were 15 years old, you thought would bring you a place of identity. And so to wrestle well with this idea of what is God's picture of comfort and peace inviting me to experience with a fresh ear and a fresh heart and fresh hands today. And if I'm not a follower of Jesus, this 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 is a good point to sort of say, hey, what's being sold to me here? Is this, is this just behaviors for the sake of behavior? Is this some sort of political kingdom? Is this some, some sort of partisan? Not, you know, or, or is there something bigger? And this, this is the bigger. This is the, that you would, that, that, to belong to God, to belong to God's picture of, of, of how God is working in the world, to, to, to not be exhausted or to put undue weight in things that cannot deliver what they promise. This is This is the hope of peace that's being offered here in the 40th chapter. That we don't have to live in captivity to our sin. We don't have to settle for the small comforts that that are to be enjoyed but not to be worshipped. That there's a new day ahead for us. This, This picture of comfort though and this picture of peace that's available to us is not going to be experienced passively. It's going to be an active thing. So pay attention to this. So this voice calls out, comfort my people, says your God. Verse 3, a voice of one calling. So a complimentary voice. In the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this won't be a passive experience. This is what a lot of us, though, will equate to Christmas peace. If everyone else will just go away. If that person that's causing me grief will just shut up. Or if they would just get themselves together. Then I can have peace. There will be no more conflict. There there, there will be warm, fuzzy feelings and cozy socks and hot cocoa. 
But this calls us to active stoking of peace. More on that in a minute. If, if the World Cup wants to come to your city, or the NFL, or the Olympics, or you want those things to come to your city, uh, there's a litany of things you have to do. I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but it's, uh, uh, you know, last year to, to host the World Cup. You can just do the research and see that, that there was a great deal of things that, were, that, that a country was willing to put on the line in order to have the World Cup arrive in its midst. Right? The same true, like, there's this check of Super Bowl, for Super Bowl. How many hotel rooms and how much infrastructure? And, and, and what we're going to sell you if we're the NFL or we're FIFA or we're the IOC is like, these are all the benefits of you coming, of you having us come to your town. Here's what it, here's what it will mean for generations to have that random badminton court, like built to the nines. Here's what it will mean for you. And whether or not those things actually ever deliver on their promise is another conversation or perhaps the conversation for verse 5. But what I would highlight for a minute is like that's very much in step with the words and the imagery being evoked here. That if a king's coming to an outskirt town, the king doesn't make a path for, for, for the, the, the arrival. You make a path for the king. Why? Because it's the king. Because it's the one that's brought peace. He's the one that's brought order. He's the one that's brought all the things that, that he's promised. And so you make, you make the path. When we use that phrase in the Christmas song, let earth receive your king, let every heart prepare him room. Right? This is what we're talking about. The active stoking of a, of a pathway that would be worthy of the king's arrival in my space. And, and just like you might see... <laughs> And you might cynically go, well, is it worth the tax burden? Is it worth the extra infrastructure? Is it worth the human labor to bring these respective sporting events to my town? Would it really deliver what it promises? Verse 5 tells us that this active stoking, this making a path for God's picture of peace is, is a good thing because, because God is worthy to be worshipped. The, the, because it is the mouth of the Lord that is spoken here. Um, John the Baptist loves this verse 3. Like he, he announces his whole kingdom that way. Like, like this is my whole purpose is to, to make a straight path. To, to be the hype man for the one that's coming. To, to, to tell you and to announce that the way of Jesus and the way of the Messiah is near. And so this is, I think this is a good reminder for us of how peace comes about. Again, because if I, it's what I just said in a, a few moments ago, that a lot of us will say, well, hey, I can have peace when this thing goes away. I can have peace when this thing gets reframed, it's in, in, it's all, and it's all very passive. But this calls us to the grit and the grime and the muck and the active stoking and the sweat equity and the hard investment of making straight paths. And I think it also just calls us, if we're going to use the construction analogy for a minute, it also just calls us to, to not just do that one time 20 years ago, but to, but to do that in the context of, of the ongoing maintenance of our hearts. And this is where maybe some of us, if this is not our first advent, may be living. We've heard this all before, and we're like, every heart preparing room, okay, I'll prepare him room, I'll tell you how I'm going to prepare him room, right? A few, few weeks ago, actually it was this week, I was driving my wife to work. Uh, to drop her off, and I was driving on a road that was not smooth or calm, because it's a Baltimore road, and it's always under construction, or it's always on the list to be under construction. So, <laughs> so to, um, to be driving with an uncovered cup of hot coffee is a really foolish thing to do when you hit those potholes, which you inevitably hit on these roads, right? Like, so I, here I am having dropped off my wife and feeling good about my day, and now I'm wearing a lap full of hot coffee, <laughs> right? It, it's a reminder to me, I think, and that, that's just a sense of reminder to me that, uh, that this conversation about making straight paths, like this isn't just a thing like, well, babe, we did that 20 years ago. So we don't have to do it anymore. Right? The nature of a Baltimore road is like it's always under construction. Or it's always in need of some construction, whether or not it's being paid attention to. And I think that may be the condition of your heart this morning. 
That there may be some things that in this defi- in, in trying to live into this definition of peace, that um, some, some wilderness that needs to be prepared, some paths that need to be straightened, some, some valleys that need to be raised, some mountains that need to be made low, you know, all of those things. Why? Because God's picture of peace is, is worthy of the sweat equity. It doesn't exploit It doesn't aim to bring harm. It doesn't aim to destroy. It aims to bring life and life abundantly. This picture of peace requires some ownership, though. Some ownership of our own sin and shortcoming. I mean, I've kind of just said it with the idea of active stoking, but it's not just like, well, I'm just going to get after all of the stuff out there in the world, all the things that are wrong in the city, I think it also calls us to pay attention to the state of our own hearts. So look at verses 6 to 8 with me. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass. And all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. So to to really own this picture of peace and be pursuing it, I think there's a call here in verses 6 to 8 to pay attention to the state of our own heart. Pay attention to our own sin and how our own sin has the ability to rob others or maybe ourselves of God's definitions of peace. But also just to pay attention to our own shortcomings. Let Let me deal with the first of those. I love the imagery here in verse 6. All people are like grass. We'll we'll repeat that in a moment. And their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. I I love that analogy as it relates to my own faithfulness. I love not just my own mortality, but my own ability to like live into God's definitions of peace. Like if you're anything like me, you have some good moments. You have some moments where you're like, man, I think I killed that. I think I really, I really got through that lunch and I didn't say what I was thinking. <laughs> I really, I got into a tough conversation and I didn't do this thing. Hey, I, I, get, I get really hung up in some, 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 this pattern or that pattern. I do this self-destructive thing and, and last Friday night I didn't do it. Like, don't you have a moment or two in your life where you're like, man, I did the thing. Yeah. But don't you also have moments where you see how short-lived that is? How like you can't, you can hold it together for a little bit, but just ultimately the pain of your heart or the the power of that addiction just kind of finds a way to, to seep back in and make you feel really frail and small. And what you do with that thing next really matters. Do you, do you go to the place of shame? Do you go to the place of covering up? Do you go to the place of being hardened and cynical and saying, well, if you knew my father and if you knew my life and if you knew this, you would know I'm entitled to this thing? To open ourselves up to, to God working in our own hearts and our own sin and pushing us to walk in the light is, is one of the, the calls of the scriptures here, right? You know, um, maybe in conflicts, there's... 20 things someone else did that need to be owned. And they don't need to be owned by you, but maybe there's a thing, even in just how you're processing a wound that you've experienced, that you're carrying improperly. (laughs) You're carrying to a toxic place. And the invitation here is to say, hey, pay attention to the state of your own heart. That peace isn't just everyone else behaving, but you paying attention to the state of your own heart. What can you own? What can you control? What do you need to pay attention to? What little thing in your life could become a big thing? Because, because, you know, like the flower, the faithfulness being like, you know, we we just got some flowers in our house this this past couple weeks ago, and they smelled like really great, and they like stunk up the house in all the right ways. And then, like, yesterday, I took note as my wife was moving those things to the compost. She was making the face that said she was displeased with the status of these flowers, right? She was making that face that was like, because they were no longer a pleasantry. (laughs) They were now like a liability. Now they were providing a stink and a rot. (laughs) And, And that's, there's a lot more of that in your heart and my heart than we'd like to admit. And we don't say this to like go to the place of shame. We say that to go to the place of invitation, that God's picture of peace 
is inviting us to walk into the light, is inviting us to, to deal with the infection, to deal with the wounds, to carry, to carry the pains and the lack of peace in the world in the, in the right way so that we are not consumed. Because we talked about this as well, that even when we're doing everything right, we still are short-sighted, we're still human. We don't have, we, we don't have the position to hold everyone and everything together. We said this last week, too, about hope, you know, that you can live on a steady diet of kale and CrossFit, and you can be really adept at, like, maneuvering through the world, and, and you still are limited. Your body is limited by the fact that a, a driver running a stop sign could bring mortal wounds to your body, no matter how in shape and kaled up it may be. You're not immune in your humanity to the sin of other people. You have limits. And so when we think about this picture of peace, it's good for us to keep that in mind too because, because it doesn't all hold up on you. If you're anything like me, you live in the space of the shoulds. I should do this, I should reach out to this person, I should have this conversation, I should do this thing, 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 and I should do this thing. And if I don't do those things, I will lay my head on my pillow with a great deal of anxiety and stress and guilt about the fact that I didn't get those things done and I needed to get those things done. And, and what if the universe is like going to be thrown into off its orbit because I did not do those particular things? And the invitation of this week of Advent is to say... Add this to your foundry bingo card. This goes back like, to the, the, the turns of phrase you're going to hear a lot, probably in 23, and you move to 24, you're probably still saying it. Moves us to move to this place of the position of Savior has been taken. And the good news is it's not you. Because, because even when you quiet all of the children and you get the dog finally settled, the knock of the Amazon driver is coming. <laughs> right? It just is. We will drive ourselves crazy trying to hold together all the pictures of peace in our midst or the lack of peace in our midst. And the invitation of this season is that we can play our part in ushering in God's picture of peace. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But our sin and our shortcomings prevent us from having the capacity to be the one that can hold it all together ourselves. And if we really walk in that, it, it freaks me out. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I'm finding that that's good news. That that's good news. We'll end here. To proclaim God's peace by remembering that peacemaking is not the same as peacekeeping. So, so this, this declaration of our frailty, this declaration of our smallness, the declaration of our comfort creates a bit of a ruckus because we, we go and we tell it on the mountain. I don't know if you've heard that song before, right? But here, here's, here's where you see it. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. There's disruption. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs to his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I love the, the, the imagery this ends with, with this beautiful imagery of the shepherd and this beautiful imagery that will be embodied in a couple weeks. This is why it's important for us to look at these Old Testament passages so that we can capture the beauty of this thing that we'll celebrate in two weeks when we're like, oh, what are the shepherds keeping their flocks by light? No, no, no. And Jesus going, oh, I'm the good shepherd. And what, what does that allude to? It alludes to moments like this where the character of God is being proclaimed from the mountaintops, disrupting with noise and creating a ruckus to say, hey, the good news is this picture of peace isn't on you and it isn't on me, but we can play a role in declaring it and proclaiming it by going to the high places and, and using the resource of our voice and, um, to, to point to the one that's come. And this is the work of John the Baptist. And here's the good news. We're going to talk more about him next, next week. I like to call him JTB. Here's the good news about JTB. <laughs> is, is that he's a pretty cantankerous guy. And he's kind of weird. <laughs> more than kind of weird. And, he's, and his message is a bit 
It's not warm and fuzzy. It's like, hey, repent. The kingdom of God is near. He loves Isaiah 40 and the quotations that you see in his, his life and ministry to sort of say, hey, the role of this cantankerous, weird dude that wore weird clothes was to say, hey, I can play a role in the declaration of God's picture of peace. And maybe you feel a little cantankerous and maybe you feel a bit like an outsider and maybe you don't feel all that warm and fuzzy in this holiday season and yet you can still play a role in the declaration of God's picture of peace in a time. Because here's the thing, and this is, this is the real, if you get nothing else, the, the, catch this, right? There's a difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeeping preserves the status quo, sweeps it under the rug, pretends that everything's beautiful and nothing hurts. And if, if that is God's definition of peace, then why do you go to all of this trouble? If God's definition of peace is just the beauty of the status quo, then I'm sorry, no thank you. I want no part of it. <laughs> but if it's to walk in the disruption and the promise that God is making all things new, then I love the words of Fleming Rutledge. That we are not looking back sentimentally to a baby. We are looking forward to the one and only one in whom the promise of peace will one day be fulfilled. Trusting in that promise, we can do things we thought we could not do. Relying on him, we can change our habits, confront our addictions, forgive our enemies, curb our spending, challenge our society, raise our pledge or our amount of giving, lower our defenses, speak truth. Not just all these things at once, to be sure, but even on a break from past patterns of sin, even that will be a way of its own sign of Christ's coming. Because God is out ahead of us, we know that the cover-ups... The denials, the lies, the frauds, the pretenses are all part of God's old world that is passing away. We are not trapped in our mistakes and delusions. God is enlisting us on the side of his future. So for now, <laughs> we live in that tension. There's a song that uh, perhaps you've heard. It's usually a song that I don't skip on a shuffle or a CD, but it's not a song I usually attune myself to and listen to with great anticipation. It's one that begins with this line, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. It doesn't make my playlist of favorite songs, but it stands out to me a bit this year. Because, because while that was the original context of the city of Bethlehem, an outskirts city, where God intentionally shows up to say something about the God being the, the one for the, the outskirts and one's on the edge, one's not in the power centers. Uh, the city of Bethlehem is, is sort of known today for its sort of commercial festivity around Christmas time, as you might imagine. For lights and festivals and good vibes and good times and a place to take a spiritual pilgrimage, even though the majority of the city do not identify as Christ followers. It's a great appreciation for creating an experience for those that would but not this year because this year Bethlehem which is nestled in Palestine is in the context of war and conflict and so the city has decided as you might imagine to cancel the lights and the festivals and the celebrations and the pilgrimages that all the artificial lights that would commemorate the arrival of Jesus and sort of stoke good vibes and feelings to people like you and I are not happening. Peace looks a little more this year like what one church did that's trying to celebrate. That the arrival of Jesus is showing up amongst the, the rubble of conflict and war. And so there's not lights, and there's not festivals, and there's not parades. But here's what one priest said. So this holy time is always an invitation for, the, for humanity to accept God's invitation of his love and his peace. We've decided to concentrate on that meaning of Christmas rather than showing Christmas by clothes or festivals or markets. They're, they're all beautiful things, but they're not the real meaning of Christmas. The real meaning of Christmas is that God is with us in this pain, and that God is suffering with us as we work towards peace.
Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. We are constantly confronted with the fractures of a lack of peace in this world. And so the hope of Advent, the Peace Sunday, is to open ourselves up to how God may be calling us to be a picture of peace, how God may be calling us to receive God's picture of peace, how God may be calling us to display God's picture of peace. And so as we receive communion together, I think the question for us to consider this morning is, as we partake of bread and cup and we celebrate that, that Jesus arrives amongst the rubble and the darkness of our own life, what will we do? Will we wall up and say, hey, that's a thing for other people. That's not a thing for me. I don't need it. Will we cover up and we'll say, hey, someone else, someone else's sin, fine, I don't really have anything to deal with. Or will we open up to the possibility that God wants to meet us and walk with us and be a part of ushering in this peace to the world? Would you pray with me as we move into a time of communion and reflection? God, there are so many pictures of false peace being sent to us. They're sentimental. Some of them come from, well, some of them are, and some of them come from the voice and the screaming of angry leaders. God, would you just help us to see where your picture of peace is inviting us? In the rubble of our life, in the rubble that we experience in the world, would you help us to cling to this picture of peace in the mess of the relationships that we're experiencing and the, the things that we're feeling and even in the sin we're trying to confront in our own life and story. Thank you that your picture of peace wins. But help us to wait well and live with expectation. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.